Now, I love a good small Texas town. However, these days, the Lone Star State is much more than dirt roads and pastures. Urban life is exploding, and one of our most vibrant big cities also happens to be one of our most historic cities. So get ready, amigo, as we go to San Antonio! This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. San Antonio is the second largest city in Texas and just 80 miles south of Austin. It's also a short day trip away from countless towns in Central and South Texas. Now, when most people think of San Antonio, they think of two things, the Alamo and Tex-Mex. Well, today we are not going to the Alamo. I'm sorry, Davy Crockett. Oh, oh, Alamo. And we're not eating Tex-Mex. I'm sorry, Mariachi Chet. Hey, pobrecito. But what we are doing is seeing a different side of San Antonio that all starts just south of here. And that side is the south side. Just a short drive past the downtown San Antonio we all know and love. Just a stone's throw from the hemisphere, but that's far enough to skirt the tourist masses and find yourself immersed in the local flavor of Southtown. This is where all the cool kids hang out. For decades, Southtown set almost abandoned. That is until the artists and entrepreneurs discovered the hidden charm and, well, cheap rents of the area. And from that moment on, Southtown has never looked back. And the catalyst for this micro renaissance came from our first stop, the Blue Star Contemporary Arts Center. And this is its director, Bill Fitzgibbons. Welcome to Blue Star Contemporary. Yeah, uh, Blue thank you. Star started uh, back in the uh, mid 80s. In fact, they opened in July of 1986. No air conditioning, uh, <laughs> 100 and something degrees. And they were, wow. they were hoping that a couple hundred people would show up because this was a little bit rundown area. So what happened was over 3,000 people came to the opening. <laughs> a few hundred, a few and thousand. <laughs> exactly. And we've been there ever since. So we've obviously caught Blue Star at a transition. But that's one of the coolest parts. They're always changing things up. Today they're getting ready to show off the quirky and downright hilarious works of San Antonio native Gary Sweeney. It's amazing what art can do to transform a community. And it has definitely worked its magic in Southtown. But I don't just mean contemporary art. Folk art can be just as powerful. Welcome to Son on Hell Folk Art. It's somewhere between a high-end art gallery and a Mexican border town nightmare. But all in good fun. Hello! Oh dear, you are stunning. Oh, I'm all flushed. Oh, I am beautiful, aren't I? With curly hair. I even forgot to wax my mustache. Oh man, I could do so much with these costumes. And this monkey. All of Southtown is equal parts tradition, equal parts progress, even down to its food. This is El Sol Bakery and Bistro, a modern spin on a classic panaderia. The concept of owners, Teresa and Mauricio Romero. We have kept the traditional design of the Mexican bread, but we've given it a twist. We do it in a healthy way. Whole grain, no preservatives, no animal fat, and none of our bread is frozen. So it tastes great and it's healthy? Are you it's, kidding me? It's heart healthy, sweet tasting. Yeah. That's our motto. Fantastic. A panaderia without lard? Who ever heard of such a thing? Yeah, I think I'll just take this right here. Yeah, right there. take it along with me. <laughs> Crew, can y'all help me out with some of these right there? And while it all looks great, I'm a sucker for tradition and bright colors. Nothing like a mid-morning pink concha y espresso. Man, that's good. Now to take some for the road. Now of the three or so districts that make up Southtown, by far the most grand and most exquisite was settled by a group most don't associate at all with the Tex-Mex flavor of San Antonio, the Germans. This is the King William District, or Kaiser Wilhelm, once known as Sauerkraut Bin. Many were the titans of industry here in San Antonio and built homes to match their fortunes. 
one of the most immaculate, just happens to be open for tours. This is curator Meg Nowak. Welcome to Villa Finale. Thank you. Uh, this house was built in 1876 by Russell Norton, an Englishman who lived among uh, Germans here in King William. But um, the most important owner that we talk about now is Walter Mathis, who purchased the house in 1967. And we'll learn a lot more about Walter Mathis when you tour the house with me. Well, let's go. So come on in. Donated to the National Trust in 2006, Villa Finale is something special. Because anything that requires booties is kind of important. From the rugs on the floor to the chandeliers on the ceiling, Villa Finale is filled with items of antiquity. Lots of items. There are 10,000 objects in this house. <laughs> and they are, they are unmoved from the, the day he died, which was in um, 2005. OK, so nothing's been touched. This is how he lived? Yes. Sort of inside of a museum. Yes, oh, yeah. yes, as he intended. A home museum of very, very curious things which give a glimpse into the curious nature of their owner. Spanish colonial retablos, enough to fill a room. But this could be someone's legitimate full collection, yes. and he put it on one wall. Yes, over, over a piano. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mathis was indeed a collector of, well, collections, weaponry, shaving mugs, and rare musical instruments. This is a deluxe violano virtuoso. How cool is that thing? There's really something for everyone in this house. The whole house is full of eye candy. It's a real so, experience. It, right, right, yeah. exactly. It is an experience. How did he read the ones on the top he shelf? He didn't. Uh, okay. No, because he's converted his uh, library ladder into an easel, as you can see. <laughs> interesting guy for sure, with a very interesting fascination with a certain French emperor. He said in an interview, if the house were burning down, he would save one item, and that was the Napoleon death mask, which is over on Napoleon this side. Napoleon death mask? Yes. Um, but this actually was taken uh, upon Napoleon's death in 1821. So it's quite something. It this is, is a little bit creepy. It's, it's almost too lifelike. It, it, well, it's death-like. <laughs> death <laughs> yeah. There we go, better word. Yes, Mr. Mathis loved collections, but the largest items he ever collected were homes. At one point, he owned 14 homes in the King William District, which he sold to other conservation-minded folks, saving not just the homes and the district, but the very history of San Antonio itself. Gosh, part of me thinks he would have loved to have lived in a different era back. I think back. so. Well, he was raised by two very Victorian women, and I think he really, um, he really liked that. It was a great, great appeal to him. Well, I'm glad he lived, you know, when he did to collect this collection yes. for us to come and look because it is yes. just phenomenal. You know, sometimes it just takes eccentric people to do something as amazing as save history. Now on to another historical building of Southtown, but for a very different reason. You know, after much soul searching, I've decided it's time for me to enter a convent. For lunch, I'm not giving up day tripping. This is convent-turned-restaurant Liberty Bar, which for 25 years inhabited this old house, but now has some new digs in Southtown. And this is its owner, Dwight Hobart. But it seems like you moved from one old cool place to another. How'd you, I mean, was that a tough move to make? It, it was a tough move. Ultimately, it was easy because this place had its own character. It's a kind of neo-baroque fantasy. It, it looks like <laughs> something that Walt Disney would do if he had joined monastery. Which <laughs> like that, couldn't yeah. be more a part of Southdown. And this building has been since it was built in 1882. So tell me a little bit about the food you guys are serving. How, how would you describe it? Well, our motto is serious food. And that's pretty much the story. It's American cooking uh, from New England through the Southern United States all the way into the interior of Mexico. Okay, it's quite a region to cover, but I like it. It is, it is. It's authentic. We bake all of our own bread, we bake our own pies and cakes, we crank our own ice cream, and we make our own pasta. As the motto says, that's serious food. Um, you can't find a menu like this in San Antonio uh, anywhere. Almost like South Texas traditional, like Mexican, but also kind of ranch style cooking almost. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I kind of see what you you're getting. Yeah, I kind of I, I yeah. feel that. Okay. All right, so what did you get today? I had the um, chili marita, a gruyere cheese, and tomato sandwich. Wow, there's a lot of words in there. Chili. Oh, it's like a grilled cheese. Yes, but spicy. 
Oh, nice. It's awesome. You have to talk down to my level. I got a grilled <laughs> cheese sandwich. <laughs> now, do you have to bless the food, or is it already blessed just by the fact that you're eating it here? I think it's blessed already. already so you don't have to worry about the blessing. <laughs> okay, very cool. The bread, the vegetables, it all looks and smells amazing. Time to get serious about chowing on serious food. All right, so when I found out they made their own fettuccine pasta, I had to try it. So I got pasta with shrimp, onions, garlic, and then a chili morita sauce, which is a smoked jalapeno paste. Should be pretty spicy, and I'm excited about that. And over here, this is the Ensalada Argentina. It's Argentinian salad, arugula, vinaigrette, Parmesan flakes. I love it, it's fresh, it's light, it's simple. You know, there's just something about fresh pasta. It, it, it tastes completely different. This is some of the best fettuccine I've ever had. And the shrimp are perfectly cooked and spicy. I love the old place of Liberty Bar, but I gotta say, I like the new place just as much. And with food like this, they can go wherever they want to. I'm still gonna eat it. All right, so I'm about to do something I don't normally recommend, biking immediately after lunch. Push it too hard and you'll be revisiting everything you just ate. However, here in San Antonio, they make it super easy to bike anytime. All you gotta do is hop on a B-cycle, even in boots. B-cycle is San Antonio's bike share program. A simple fee gets you a bike all day. I'm heading out from Roosevelt Park and heading south of Southtown, down the San Antonio River. San Antonio has done an amazing job renovating and beautifying the river, well beyond the traditional downtown river walk. After all, the river is the reason San Antonio exists. The Spanish chose this location to settle some of Texas's first missions. Now you already know about Mission San Antonio de Valero, AKA the Alamo. But what about the other four missions of San Antonio? Well, we're about to learn, starting with Mission Concepcion. Park the B-cycle, and let's head in. We now interrupt this programming to remind you to like and subscribe. Now back to the road. Okay, so this is park ranger Tatum Weeks, and she's gonna tell us a little bit about where we're standing right now. Well, you're at Mission Concepcion. Oh, it's beautiful. The best preserved mission site here in the national park here in San Antonio. So why so many missions packed into this region here? Yeah, we have five missions just three miles apart from each other. In the late 1600s, early 1700s, the San Antonio River is the only constant source of water here in this area. Water's very important Water's in Texas. Water's vital. <laughs> The Spanish missionaries are sent here to do the colonization work of the Spanish Empire. They are here to make the American Indian of South Texas into Spanish citizens. Not a simple task, but the Spanish knew that to control the new world, they needed to control the people and make sure that they followed Spanish rules, of which there were three. All rise for the rules of Spain. Numero uno, speak a Spanish. Numero dos, get a job. Numero tres, be Catholic. And that last rule is why they built such beautiful churches. Now, this church is really the closest one we have to what all of the churches really would have looked like. Nothing here has ever fallen apart. Our dome is original, and the bell towers, which are down there, those are original too. So oh, amazing. So this has seriously withstood the test of time. It's the best preserved site here in San Antonio. And it would have been painted like this? Exactly into? like this. You know, all of these missions would have been painted. I call it a big old advertisement for Catholicism out here in the middle of the frontier. Remember, these Franciscans didn't have neon. They had <laughs> fresco. Ah. Uh -huh. But what's neat here is you get to see the original pattern of the church. They scraped away layers and layers and layers of old plaster, and they found the original pattern. So we look as close to our 1750 version as possible. Amazing. And this is still in use today? We are all active parishes here in the National Park. We have four churches within the National Park that are still active sites. Wow, still have their own congregations like they've had for 300 mm -hmm. years. Amazing. So Concepcion is the best preserved mission, but now it's time to head about a mile down river, Mission San Jose. You know, I had to ride the bike, but it looks like Tatum found a car. Hey, Chad, I beat you. All right, yeah, rub it I in, know, Sam, I know, I know, ha, ha, ha. Well, hey, welcome to Mission San Jose, the largest mission in North America. We are considered the queen of the missions because of our size. Wow. And one time we had over 400 native people living here. 
So largest in terms of population or in the size of the grounds? Size the... of the grounds. We're a six acre compound. Wow, well it looks like it's in great shape. I mean, is most of this original? Oh, I wish. So we're going on about 300 years here. So if we were original, our walls would be in great shape. Okay, okay. We were restored in the 1930s by the Works Progress Administration. But one thing the wall does is it sort of blocks out the outside world and you can really sort of look 360 degrees and feel like maybe you've stepped onto the original mission ground. Absolutely, and that's what it's supposed to do. One of the many reasons Mission San Jose is so popular, especially for weddings and wedding photographers. And the inside is just as stunning. So this is San Jose's retablo. Wow. It's pretty massive. It, pretty impressive. It is. I mean, it's it is beautiful. sparkly and beautiful, yeah, and freshly painted, you know? Yes, it is. Very freshly painted. Um, this retablo was added about a year ago to this church. Okay, so it's fairly new. It is. This is for today's parish, most definitely. And I think the gold is also to celebrate the fact that this church is known as, well, the queen of the missions of San Antonio. So you gotta have a little gold for the queen. <laughs> she needs a little gold in her crown, yeah, she got right? a little, little gold, a little bling. Wow, I am impressed. And there's still two more missions downriver. The next is Mission San Juan, which paints a much more rustic picture of mission life. It's also the only San Antonio mission with a known and designated holy burial ground. You know, it is sad to think about, but death was actually a huge part of mission life. There were years when as much as 70% of the native population was killed by disease. Diseases carried over from the very missionaries that sought to help them. Now even further down is the Spanish Aqueduct, a national historic landmark in its own right used to carry water from the San Antonio River to the mission and its crops. Which brings us to the last mission, Mission Espada, which was actually the first mission in all of Texas when it was founded out east near present-day Palestine. Not just the Alamo, but all five missions of San Antonio are an amazing part of our Texas history and an absolute must-see for every Texan. Now, while we're down south, it's time to see another legendary part of San Antonio. Not exactly historically legendary, more like urban legendary. The haunted ghost tracks of San Antonio. Why are they haunted, you ask? Well, let me tell you. Flashlight, the legend goes something like this. It was a rainy Texas morning and a school bus full of children approached these tracks. Well, as the bus crossed, it stalled out. The oncoming train couldn't stop in time, and the rest, I can't even mention it. But to this very day, the ghosts of those little children come out to protect anyone that stalls near the tracks, pushing their car over the tracks to safety. And we're gonna try it right now. Are you ready, crew? Here it goes. All right, we put the car in neutral. We stop the engine. And let's see. I'm not pushing the brakes. I'm not pushing the gas. I'm not even holding the steering wheel. And we are definitely moving. This is freaky, guys. Something is happening. And we're speeding up as we get close to the tracks. I'm pretty sure that we're going uphill. This is weird. No! Oh, wow! We just went over the tracks and the gas wasn't on. I wasn't pushing anything. Something happened, guys. I don't know what that was, but that was all kinds of freaky. Okay, and here's what you do next. You actually have to get out of your car, you go to the back, and if you bring baby powder, you can actually find the fingerprints of those little children. Oh my goodness. Oh, there's definitely handprints back here. Oh, this is freaky, and there seems to be some sort of, something, some sort of message here. <sighs> wa wash me. Wa wa Wash me? Wash me? Really? <laughs> Funny. Funny kids, wash me? Oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. Taunted by ghost children. Not what I had in mind. Okay, so you can choose whether or not you believe that one. But one thing is definitely true, and that's that I'm hungry. Now street food's nothing new in San Antonio, and it's been around, well, about as long as they've had streets. But these new food trucks on the block are taking San Antonio street food to a whole new level. This is Alamo Street Eat Bar, one of San Antonio's new food truck hotspots. But this one is especially cool. It's like a full restaurant experience. TV, 
bar, music, only you get to pick the kitchen. You want it to be a burger joint? Boom. A Cajun joint? A barbecue joint. What's your fancy day, Tripper? Well, I know what I came for. Chili. From the Institute of Chili. Okay, so I'm here with Chili Queen Ana Fernandez. Hey, so tell me a little bit about the Institute of Chili. Well, uh, the Institute of Chili, we're a food truck, and um, we are paying homage to the original Chili Queens of San Antonio. That's because, as I see it, the Chili Queens are the uh, street food pioneers of San Antonio. And what they would do is they would go in their trucks, and they would bring chili to the plaza and sell it to people, cowboys, tourists, locals. They're said to have invented Tex-Mex food. Not just chili con carne, but actual Tex-Mex food. So, in that time-honored tradition, Chili Queens, Ana and Jen, are bringing chili back to the street. The chili itself is a traditional scratch-made recipe. However, the dishes that they put it on have been kicked up a few notches. Okay, maybe a few hundred notches. Well, our number one bestseller is called The Bomb, and it's uh, basically it's a shredded pork sandwich, and then it's got chili on top of that, and then it has a fried egg on that, which is our signature item. We do the Roosevelt, which is like a Frito pie with uh, two tamales and a fried egg on top. Nice! So this really is like a blending of old Tex-Mex styles with the new wave of food trucks. Everything we make is from scratch, completely from scratch everything. We make everything on the truck. And I'm officially hungry enough to eat my own chili covered leg. Better grab a seat. All right, so this is the bomb, an Institute of Chili specialty. They gave me a spork to eat it with, but I think I'm just gonna dig in with my hands. It's a little barbecue, it's a little Tex-Mex, it's a little homestyle chili. That is all Texas right here on a bun. I'm in chili heaven right now. That is delicious. And there comes the eye-watering reflex. I don't have to tell you this chili is spicy. Just look at my face. I'm gonna have to go in with this pork. It basically turned into like a bready, sort of porky, eggy Frito pie, but I'm in. I'm into it. I'm definitely into it. I hope they clean these tables because I'm gonna just eat off of them. Man, I'm tempted to hang out and eat at all of these trailers, but I gotta save room for one more stop. So we've already talked about Southtown's German history. Well, those German immigrants built more than just houses in Southtown. They built gardens, beer gardens, and the Beethoven Manicor has been around since 1867. This is its current president, Klaus Heider. We are the oldest sing society in the Southern United States, so. Wait, did you say singing society? Yes. Not we, just we drinking sing society. No, no, no. no singing. singing. Singing society. So, Manicor actually stands for Men's Choir, initially started by San Antonio residents to get together and raise their voices in song and their glasses in cheer for Mosulan Germany. Now, our purpose is our organization is a fostering of German music, culture, and customs. And the German culture is flowing tonight just as it has been for almost 150 years. And today, it's open to Germans and non-Germans alike. Everybody says, best kept secret in San Antonio. <laughs> I believe it. I think that actually goes for all of Southtown. Whether you bask in its art and food, or whether you head further south to trace the very origins of Texas, South San Antonio proves that the road less traveled is often the road worth taking. How could I pass this up? some German goulash, bratwurst and sauerkraut, and das Boot. You know, something about all this just feels right, you know? Deep inside of me. Ha ha ha! So, as the Germans say, get mit Gott. That's, uh, via con Dios in German. Ah, now for the sausage. Ja? Oh. It's good, no? Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it always happens. Get out of here. That's my chili. Come on. Buddy thinks just because I dropped it on the ground, I'm not going to eat it. Come on, what are you doing? I'm still eating that. Get out of here. The sausage, you, you silly little sausage. You're not staying in the pot. Why, you ask? Why are they haunted? Well, let me tell you. All right. Try it again. Try it again. And a school bus full of children approached the approach. Dang it. Well, the oncoming, oncoming. And suddenly, in a crash of fury and metal and bloody children. Well, it was too 
close late. <laughs> Dang it! Just up ahead are the haunted ghost tracks of Sam. <laughs> Stop, dude! All right, ready? Howdy, y'all. Follow along with my adventures at Chet Tripper on Instagram and at the Day Tripper TV on Facebook and YouTube. Or head to thedaytripper.com for travel guides, past episodes, and info on our mobile app and Team Day Tripper. This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. Howdy, y'all. Chet the Day Tripper here. Thanks so much for tripping with us. Uh, remember, while you're here, like this video, subscribe to our channel so that we can stay out there on the road and keep on tripping. <laughs> Did we miss anything in this town? Leave us a comment, let us know. We love finding out about new stops with all your tips. And if you love Epic Texas Day Trips, remember to check our channel. We got a lot of them on there. Also, don't forget, if you want some sweet Day Tripper merch or another cool Texas made product, Come see us in Georgetown at the Day Tripper World Headquarters. You can also shop online if you check the link down there in the caption. All right, y'all. Bye, Condios, amigas.